Until recently, I used to call these figures polygon spirals, but I found out that the correct term is spirangles. Wikipedia describes them as figures related to a spiral. Spirangles are similar to spirals in that they expand from a center point as they grow larger, but they are made out of straight line segments instead of curves. Antagma has published a rather famous tutorial for Houdini almost five years ago, detailing their approach to building quilling-like structures. I enjoyed it very much at the time, but today I'll show you how to generate them procedurally in Blender, using geometry nodes. And while the final result might seem similar, I promise you that the method I used is very different. Let me explain the principle first. We start with a polygon, duplicate it several times and scale each double from the center. Open each line by removing the last segment, shrink every new last segment and finally connect all segments sequentially with a curve. This setup works flawlessly regardless of the number of points a polygon has. And you can easily walk the way from here to there. Remember this one? Let's start with a polygon circle Set the number of vertices to 5 for now and the fill type to triangles. Subdivide it once and append a dual mesh node. This figure has triangles, quads and a pentagon, so it's perfect for demonstration. We will build everything needed for the spirangles into a node group which we can save as an asset and easily reuse later on any polygonal mesh. Inside it, split the edges so we can work on each polygon separately, scale the faces uniformly using a scale element node, add a custom parameter to control this value from the outside and set its range from 0 to 1. Let's duplicate the faces now, add an external parameter for the amount, call it steps, and set the value to 5. Now scale each duplicate using another scale elements node. Dividing the duplicate index by the total number of steps should set the scale of each face from 0 to 1. But the problem is that the first polygons are scaled completely and we can't even see them. A quick remedy is to add one to the duplicate index before the division takes place. That should spread the polygons more evenly. Convert the meshes to curves and toggle the cyclic option off. We open the curves, now we need to scale their last segment. This means we need to shorten the distance of the last point from the previous one. Add a set position node. Limit its influence only to the last point on each spline by connecting an end point selection node. Set the start size to 0 and the end to 1. To get the position vectors of the last point, append a sample index node after toggling the curve cyclic option off. Set the data type to vector and leave the domain to points. Position is the attribute we will sample. Feed a points of curve node to the index input. We need to get the last point index of each curve. Add an index node to the curve index input. Remember that the sample index node works in the point domain, so the index node returns the point indices in this case. Instead, have the indices evaluated in the splines domain. To see the result, add a viewer node and feed the point index to the value. Go to the spline sections in the spreadsheet window and see that for each spline, the first point index is returned. Increase the sort index value to get the next point, and the next, and so on. Because the points per spline differ, we cannot set a single number here. We need to feed the total point count per spline into this input. Duplicate the points of curve node and connect the total output to the sort index input. Again, Feed the index evaluated per spline as the curve index. Because the indices start counting from 0, the last point index will be the total point count minus 1. The sample index node now returns the position vector of the last point for each spline. 
To get the vectors for the previous points, we duplicate this branch of nodes, holding Ctrl plus Shift plus D to keep the connections intact, and increase the value to subtract from the total points of each spline to 2. Clean up the node tree a bit. We have now the position vectors of both last points of each curve. Subtract from the last point vector the previous one. This results in a direction vector that the last point should travel along. Add this direction to the previous point vector and feed the result to the position input of the set position node. Nothing seems to have changed, but if you scale the subtraction result before the addition and slide the scale value, you will see the last segment shrink or expand. It is obvious that one single value won't do, so we need to drive the scale with a field that varies per curve. Let's visualize a simpler example. There is an interesting relationship between the index number of curves and the scale ratio. I discovered it purely by chance. For all the segments to be parallel to the edges of the polygon, the first segment needs to be scaled by a ratio of 1 over 2, the second one with a ratio of 3 over 4, the next one has 5 over 6, and then follows 7 over 8, 9 over 10, and so on. You can clearly see a pattern here. The numbers of those fractions are sequential, and so are the curve indices. With some simple arithmetic, we can get those fractions from the indices. First, add 1 to the curve indices, so we can start counting from 1, then multiply by 2. Now the sequence reads 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, etc. This sequence matches perfectly the denominators of our fractions. Subtract 1 from this sequence of numbers and we get 1, 3, 5, 7, 9 and so on, which matches perfectly with the numerators of our fractions. To get the right scale amount, divide the numerators by the denominators. This is the formula we need to apply. Index plus 1 times 2 minus 1 over index plus 1 times 2. Returning to our scene, get the duplicate index plus 1 result earlier from the tree, multiply it by 2, subtract 1, then divide it by the previous branch. Feed the result to the scale input. Now we scaled every last segment of each curve to the right amount to form a spirangle. The last task is to connect all duplicates into one curve. There is no magic node in Blender to merge curves into one, but we'll work around that. Let's first generate one spline per face. We already have many duplicates of those, let's keep only one face and delete the rest. Add a delete geometry node and change the type to spline. The selection of curves to delete will be based on their index number. All the faces have the same number of duplicates, so it makes sense to use a modulo function with the number of duplicate steps as an argument. This returns a list of numbers ranging from 0 to the maximum number of steps. The delete geometry selection input accepts boolean values, so every number greater than 0 will be treated as true and all the duplicates, except for the very first one, will be marked as eligible for deletion. Resample each remaining curve with the same point count of all the duplicate splines for each face. Use a points of curve node to get the total amount of points per curve and multiply them by the number of steps. Now the total point count of our single splines matches the points count of the duplicates. Let's position those points based on the index number. Append a set position node at the end, together with the sample index from the duplicates. Set the data type to vector and feed a position node as the value. The points have matching indices, 
so every point of our splines should jump at the position of its counterpart whose index it matches. We're not done yet. Careful observation will reveal that the spiral splines are not fully aligned parallel to the outer edges. But we can easily fix that by inserting a reverse curved node before sampling the duplicate splines point positions. Now we have a fully working setup. Hit tab to get out of the node group and play with the scale and number of steps. Don't forget to document your node tree for future reference, frame the nodes and rename those frames based on their function. You can feed this node group any polygon mesh and it will return a spirangle for each face. Play on your own and be creative with those meshes and curves. The possibilities are endless. The aim of this video was to explain how to build spirangles, so I will stop at that. If you made it here, thank you for watching. And if you like the video, please share the knowledge.